how would you uh, how would you handle uh, lower income families? Clearly, mathematically, sales taxes are going to affect on a on a percentage basis. Uh, someone that makes one hundred fifty or two hundred thousand dollars a year, of course, is going to not feel that burden nearly as much as somebody that makes forty thousand dollars a year uh, or less. How, how do you how do you mitigate that for families with whom there's there's not parity if you're not making significantly more money? Well. Everything is regressive. Everything's regressive. You know, the cost of a soda is takes more of a of a a lower income person's salary than it does a higher income person's salary. So what you have to do is understand that we all benefit from those government services and everyone needs to pay a portion, a reasonable fee for those services. We have, I think, done a good job in Texas to try to mitigate regressivity in the sales tax by exempting food and medicine from the sales tax. I would expect that the legislature would be very concerned about that and would not want to create, um, create a taxing structure that is oppressive. I would argue that the, the property tax creates much more re regressivity. Those folks are trying to rent apartments, uh, live in mobile homes or trailer homes, and, and are paying these inflated costs because of uh, the property tax. So going to a sales tax will spread that burden more equitably across the society, and we, I would expect, would continue to exempt medicine and food so that we uh, reduce the impact of that to the degree possible. For the audience, uh, if you'd like to prepare your questions, I'm going to ask uh, Canada Medina one more question and then we'll get to your audience questions here. Uh, Ms. Medina, the uh, poll numbers have changed for you very significantly. Uh, if I'm understanding them right, in November you were at around 4%, in January you were at around 9%, uh, which moved to 12%, and I understand now you're at 16%. I'm um, also, from what I read and understand, you hear that your fundraising has been significantly higher. In fact, you, you've raised perhaps as much as three times the money year to date than you did all of last year. Um, the question is, can you pass, uh, if, the, if the numbers are as they are today, can you pass Senator Hutchison in the next month to get into a runoff with Rick Perry? Um, I think not only are we going to pass Senator Hutchison, I really believe that we have an opportunity to pass Governor Perry. Um, that just kind of rocks the political world on its heels. People say it cannot be done. Um, I, I have to hope and believe that we're going to see people voting in this primary that aren't showing up on any pollsters radar screen anywhere. Uh, certainly this country saw that happen in the presidential primary on the Democrat ticket uh, two years ago. I believe we're going to see it on the Republican ticket in Texas this primary cycle. And if, in fact, that happens, then we will win this race clear away on March 2nd. Uh, failing that, barring that, we're absolutely prepared to be in a runoff. Uh, we're not letting up. The campaign team is not letting up. And I, and I think uh, those of you supporting the campaign in this audience should draw strength and courage from the knowledge that there are people working aggressively all over this state, just about everywhere that I speak now, and for probably the last month, six weeks, uh, almost every audience, I have people afterwards coming up to me with tears rolling down their face. That hasn't happened in Texas in a long time. People are very passionate about what we're fighting for here. And as a result of that, I've said from the beginning, this race is going to be won with shoe leather and elbow grease, and that's what's happening. I absolutely believe that we will make a runoff. Don't take that for granted. Recognize we've still got a lot of work to do and keep working hard, but the victory is ours for the taking if we will continue that press. And certainly we've seen it reflected in the growth in our own polling numbers. But I think more significantly than that, and the thing that hasn't gotten a lot of uh, press play, is in this last reporting period, which was the period from January 1st to January 21st, Medina for Texas campaign took in $63,000 from individuals who contributed $200 or less, small donors. We took in $63,000. Kay Hutchison and Rick Perry took in $16,000. 
the Medina campaign in that time frame had 1,400 financial contributors, more than three times the number of donors to either the Kay Hutchison or Rick Perry campaign. Three times the number of donors. Can't do that with that hand. Three times the number of donors. Um, that ought to say something. There is something happening here. People are excited about this campaign. And um, I don't know about you, but I think three times the number of voters wins just about any election. So uh, let's keep that momentum up. We're going to try to share that so that people understand how much enthusiasm there is for this campaign. But yes, absolutely believe we'll be in a runoff and am optimistic that we may take the thing clear away on March 2nd. Please give a warm round of applause to candidate Deborah Dean. You'll note to my right is the uh, big handsome man in the uh, Mr. Roger sweater. Who would uh, like to ask, uh, would like to uh, go around, so please do raise your hands, come to the end of an aisle if it's the easiest thing to do. And, uh, I'm Mike really Bannon. right here so I can see you, because I don't know about y'all, but those lights, and I can't see anybody that's sitting over here. Uh, so Wait, you become a VAT tax. Ask you the grant. Yeah. Ask the microphone. Oh, sorry. Your sales tax, will it be an end-use-only tax, or does it become a VAT tax? I think that's really a question for the Texas legislature. I know um, one of the concerns that our economic policy team has is that we not create a state <coughs> sales tax. Um, property tax in Texas today is a local property tax. It funds school districts, cities, emergency service districts, MUD districts. Um, I believe, we believe that the proper legislative remedy is a bill that rescinds the authority to levy a property tax and permits the raising of that revenue in a, in a different way uh, preferably a consumption or a sales tax, but that's a discussion the legislature is going to have. I think many of us are, are aware of, as you indicate, you know, an in-use tax or a VAT tax and what the differences are. Uh, I would expect that it'll be an in-use sales tax, but we're beginning that dialogue with state representatives and senators today looking at crafting that legislation and having that debate now. And I think as soon as we know who the Republican nominees are after March 2nd, we ought to really be able to pick up that discussion and refine it more so that we'll understand what we can get to the table with um, in January of 2011. If you would, uh, state your name and, and your city as well, just for those that might be interested, we have folks represented from all the counties contiguous to Dallas as well as Dallas. So let us know the city you live in as well, please. Yes, John Cook from uh, Terrell, Texas. Um, we, I want to kind of change the issues a little bit because I want to get off of physical for just a minute. Um, we have uh, the other candidates speaking pretty boldly about how they feel about um, life. And that's pretty much where Governor Perry goes quite a bit. So. And what I'd like to ask you is, do you, and if you would answer yes or no first before you qualify, um, do you believe that life before uh, birth is a protected life, God ordained, and do you believe that there should be no exceptions, rape, incest, uh, life of the mother may be a different topic, but rape or incest, do you believe that life is very important to you. Um, yeah, I've for a long time, in fact, I think the very first uh, Republican state convention that I went to, I found the button, the political button that I thought was perfect for me. It said pro-life period. I believe life begins at conception and ends at the time of natural death. I believe it is the job of government to protect life, liberty, and property People say to me, well, if you're a pro-life in that fashion, you must be, you must oppose the death penalty. And I have had to clarify and say, no, I believe it's government's job to protect innocent life. There's none more innocent than that unborn babe. It is absolutely the proper role of government to protect that unborn child. There are no exceptions. It is a life at conception. You do not make exceptions for rape, incest, or the life of the mother, which as a registered nurse, I would argue is a, is a illegitimate argument uh, or defense. 
that being said, I believe that there are some crimes that are so heinous that death is the only just punishment. Part of government's job is to punish um, the violation of life, liberty, and property. And so when you violate that, um, the justice is, on occasion, the death penalty.